Praise the Lord. Right where you are, wherever you are, whether it's your living room, whether it is in your kitchen, your dining room, wherever you are, right where you are, at home, right where you are, right in your house, right where you live, right in your situation. Jesus didn't say, I come that you might have church. He said, I come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. And I want to know this morning, are you ready to have abundant life? This morning. So right there in your living room, in your dining room, some of you might not have gotten out of bed yet this morning. And you're watching in your bed. And that's okay. As long as you don't go to sleep. But right there in your kitchen, clap your hands and give God some praise right where you are. Thank Him for his love. Can you love him right now? Praise him for what he's done. All week long, he's been praise, he's been glorified, he's been blessing you all week long. Give him some praise. He's watching over you. He's been watching over you. He's been blessing you. He's provided for you. You deserve, you, you should be giving him some praise. I'm so excited this morning. I'm having trouble getting it all out. Just praising him this morning. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. We're going to be in 1 Kings, and I forgot the passage that we're actually going to be in this morning. 1 Kings chapter 4, starting at verse... One, First Kings chapter 4, verse 1. This is a passage that is very familiar to many of us. It's been preached on, many have taught on it, but I believe that there is a good word for us during this time in our life, our lives. Because of the times we live in, and these are turbulent times that we live in. These are unlike anything else I've seen ever before in my life. And I believe many of us can say that. Um, these are turbulent times, but these are different. These are times when we can't come to church like we normally do and sit up here and cross our legs and cross our arms, which... It's kind of good as a pastor that I don't see you sitting here crossing your legs going, bless me, preacher. Um, but we can't come up in here and cross our legs and cross our arms and look important. Because we're finding out today as a country and as a church and as believers that we have a devil to fight right now. Said so we have a devil to fight right now. And we need a breakthrough from the Lord. And so I believe that this passage will help us get there. And we're going to start this passage today. And it may take us a few weeks to get through this passage. And actually, we probably won't even get to this passage today. Because we've got some work to do to get there. But let's start there. 1 Kings chapter 4, starting at verse 1, and I'm reading from God's, words, God's Word translation this morning. You read with whatever translation works for you. One of the wives of, the, of a disciple of the prophets called to Elisha, Sir, my husband is dead. You know how we feared the Lord? Now a creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. Elisha asked her, what should I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She answered, I have nothing in the house except a jar of olive oil. Elisha said, borrow many empty containers from all your neighbors. Then close the door behind you and your children and pour into all those containers. When one is full, set it aside. 
So she left him, closed the door behind her and her children. The children kept bringing containers to her, and she kept pouring. When the containers were full, she told her son, bring me another container. He told her, there are no more containers. So the olive oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, he said, sell the oil and pay your debt. The rest is for you and your children. The second verse is where I'd like to draw our attention. Elisha says to this upset, this disturbed and almost hostile woman, what should I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? That one question, what do you have in your house? I want to tell you this morning, what you've been looking for is in your house. I, I know you may not believe it this morning, maybe because you've been living in the situation so long and you may not trust you may not trust me to know that there's something in the house that you have not seen, but I want you to know what you've been looking for is in your house. It's in the house, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We thank you, we praise you, we give you glory and honor for what you are doing and what you're going to do. Now open our minds, open our hearts, open our ears, help us to receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We cannot understand church or life or people until we begin to understand God. When we begin to seek wisdom, Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Now this is not fear in the sense of terror or fright, but fear in the sense of reverence or respect. We begin to wise up the moment we begin to prioritize him and put him first. The very first thing that God teaches Moses in the book of Gen Genesis is that he is an Elohistic God, that he is Elohim. And we've talked about this many times, that in the beginning, Elohim created. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the creator, and if you've been created in his likeness, which Genesis teaches us, then you are creative, uniquely creative, separate and apart from anything else that was created in the earth. Man has a unique ability to be creative like the God who created him. Think of the last 200 years of the, of the amazing things that have been created, cars, the cameras that we're using today, the iPhone that is live streaming us today, and hopefully it's not crooked and, and it's not upside down and I'm not levitating today, um, but that we're all worked out. I even tested it and hopefully it's right. But the internet that we're using today, Facebook that y'all are watching us live today, the lights in your houses, the stoves that many of you will use today to cook lunch, the, the restaurants that use carryout that you'll call Uber Eats to have bring to your house today. The list goes on and on. And just a few hundred years ago, we didn't have the benefit of the technology that we have today. And that technology is keeping several people alive today. When I think about the respirators that are at the hospital that people are using to keep alive, that technology, and who knows what will be invented in the years to come, because we are creative. I, I love to watch the show Shark Tank. And I'm amazed at some of the things that are invented on there. 
Just this last week, there was a fellow that was on there that created a way to keep raccoons away from the things around his house. There was a, he created this spike tread. And if my father's watching today, maybe he ought to get these to keep around, get, keep away from his chickens. But this spike tread, because the raccoons come up, they put their little paws on the spike track and they go away. It, it's, it keeps, uh, it's a humane way to keep the raccoons away. Uh, there are some great things that are created. Of course, some of the things that come on Shark Tank, I sit there and think, some people have too much time on their hands. Um, and I think some of the sharks think that too. Um, there, there are people without money in our world today and without a lot of resources who have built houses out of the mud and the dirt. I remember going to Peru and, and making, helping them make adobe bricks to build their houses and to build the church. Uh, if you put any man anywhere, he will create something because he is creative because he is created in the likeness and image of God. The Bible says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep water. The Spirit of God was hovering over the water. Then God said, and whatever he, whenever he says something, something is going to happen. Then God said, let there be light, and so there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. Before there was a choir to sing, a praise team to lead in worship, a band to play, before there was anybody to praise him, God praised himself and said, it's good all by myself. He is the mighty God who stepped out on nothing and said, let there be something. And it became whatever he said, because he's sovereign. He's absolutely in control. He totally reigns. He's omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient in all places, in all time. Um, uh, uh, omniscient, all-knowing, not guessing, not wondering, not figuring, not computing, not putting in the graph, not putting things in a graph, not looking at the model. He knows the end from the beginning, the answer before the question, the sum total before you figure out the equation. Because he's God, he sits on the circle of the earth. He has all power in, it, in his hand. Nobody elected him and nobody can impeach him. He's God all by himself. Our God is an intelligent God. John begins to teach about him in John chapter 1. He says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word already existed. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was already with God in the beginning. Everything came into existence through him. Not one thing that was made without him that particular word there is logos. To talk about a particular intelligence of God, that God is intelligent, that God is not just powerful. Electricity is power, but it has no sense. Wind has force, but it has no intelligence. But our God is intelligent. He, has a he is a strategic God. He is a thinking God. He has a plan. He has a purpose. He has a wisdom. He has a strategy. In the beginning, the strategy already existed. And the strategy was with God. And the strategy was God. Everything came into existence through him. Not one thing that exists was made without him. Your God is strategic. He created everything from the book of Genesis, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, to the grass and the trees, all that grows up out of the ground. And the one thing that everything, and the one thing that everything that he created had in common, the Bible says over and over again, whose seed 
in it is inside of itself. Whose seed is inside of itself. So he created everything living to be self-perpetuating. So that he would not have to get up off his throne and start creating all over again. He said, I'm going to do this one time. And every time hereafter, you will perpetuate your own existence. By your own intrinsic discovery of what I've hidden down inside of you. I've placed treasure in the depths of your being. Whether you're a dog or a cat or a fish or an eagle or a snake or whatever you are. The ability to perpetuate yourself is hidden down inside yourself. And whatever you find, you, and whenever you find the seed, you have found what you need to perpetuate yourself. Now, go with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, where it says, As long as the earth exists, planting and harvesting, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never stop. Planting and harvesting. This, planting and harvesting, seed and harvest, that this is the strategy of God. That's why you're still here. He had a strategy. The enemy thought he had you surrounded, but God had a strategy. The enemy meant it for evil, but God meant it for good because he had a strategy. When you're crying over what happened yesterday and you're looking back over it today and you say, it was good for me that I was afflicted because God had a strategy determining the end from the beginning because he had a strategy. It's what Paul calls the infinite wisdom of God in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. It means that God has wisdom in his crevices. It's the folds of his garments. It's in the folds of his skirts. That's why the woman with the issue of blood if, said, if I may touch the hem of his garment, she reached out and touched his strategy, locked up in the folds of his priestly garment. I'm talking about your God and my God and our God, where his ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. He's already got a plan and he's able to work it out. He did not create any living thing without a seed inside of itself. Oh, you need to rejoice in that this morning. Because there's something inside of you today. There's something inside of you that God has put there. There's something that is self-perpetuating, self-producing, able to pollinate and cross-pollinate and live and thrive. There is something inside of you this morning. Oh, now we know. Now, now, now we know why the enemy fights you. It's not over what is on you. It's over what is in you. And if we're able to discover what is in you, then everything around you would begin to change to the self to the power of self discovery i think we spend too much time trying to discern other people after all your deliverance will not come from discerning what's in me your deliverance will only come when you can discern what's inside of you there is something that's there is something that is in you that the enemy hates. He hates you over the hidden treasure that is locked up way down in your spirit. And you'll never escape your circumstances until you take inventory over what God has hidden inside of you. And if you would ever lose the thing that God has, if you would ever lose 
the thing that God has hidden down inside of you, the whole creation you see is groaning and travailing in pain, waiting on you to let yourself go. The only hope then that the enemy has is to paralyze your productivity, is to cause you not to realize who you are on the inside. Oh, how can he camouflage you intrinsically and inwardly? How, how does it, he does it by the external circumstances that grieve your heart that gradually convince you that you have nothing in you that is productive. But I'm telling you this morning, the devil is a liar. In fact, when you begin to suspect that there is something inside of you, you become attracted to be around other people who know that they have something inside of them. That's why you cannot be mentored by somebody who is confused. You have to be mentored by somebody who is secure in who they are and secure in whose they are. You have to be mentored by somebody who is, if you're mentored by somebody who is insecure, the person who mentors you will turn around and try to kill you. That's what's wrong with the church now. We have too many Saul's trying to kill you. And the only reason Saul is trying to kill you is that, he, is that he dies without discovering who he really is. That's what Saul tried to do with David all of, all of Saul's life and through the reign of King Saul. You can't help me, and if you can't help me, that's why we're, that's why we are doing, that's why we do the Day of Freedoms here at, at the church. To help you know, to help you know you. To open the Word of God. To show you the Word of God. That God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. That God has a strategy. He has a plan. He has a purpose for you. And it is in you. There are people who are on the verge of exploding with great potential. They just need somebody who will pass by. Who know who they are and know what they've got and know that they can do. Know what they can do. Think of Elisha. Here he is plowing in the field behind 12 yoke of oxen, plowing in the field of mediocrity, thinking in his mind, I, was, I think I was created for more than what I'm doing right now because I am stuck in my history fulfilling the prophecies of my parents, waiting on something meaningful to happen in my life. When all of the sudden Elijah walks past him and saw something that made him drop his plow and burn his oxen and set it all on fire, kissing his mother and his father goodbye, he says, I've got to follow this man. I don't have to have a title. I don't have to have credentials. I don't have to have a salary. I don't have to have a big name. But I have to follow you so you can show me. I have to unlock lock what I have down inside of myself. Then the old man Elijah says to the young man Elisha, you have, you have asked me a hard thing. You can't get this glory easy. Do you know we're living in a generation now where people want your stuff easily? Things that you prayed for for 40 and 50 years, they want you to lay hands on them and in 30 seconds receive that. What you, they want you to <laughs> receive something that you've agonized with you, all of your life. The devil's a liar. You have to walk with me and suffer with me and talk with me and endure hardness. And if you're still here, Elijah says, if you're still there, if 
you're still there, after you've walked through all of this, if you're still there, if you're still there when I'm taken away, if you're still there, church, stop giving your glory to people who don't deserve it. Stop throwing your pearls to the swine. Stop giving your wisdom to people who don't understand it. Stop giving it to the to these Johnny come lately wannabe people who want to get something easy that it took all of your life to get. And find Somebody who will go through persecution and tests and trials and trauma and walk with you when you're not liked and talk with you when people hate you. And if they're still there, then release your glory. Oh, church, we're on the verge of something. You see, this is troubled time, but it's just on the verge of something. Glory is about to be released up in here. Glory is about to be released in your life. You have to stay with it. You have to stay in the trial. You have to stay in the trauma. You have to walk with it. You have to endure. Evening lasts for a little while, but joy comes in the morning. Oh, we're on the verge, church. Elijah has something going on that has moved Elisha to leave the familiar to the unfamiliar. Oh, it is difficult to give up the familiar for the unfamiliar. Because we hold on to our traditions, not because they're working. We hold on to them because they're comfortable. Because they're safe. Because we understand them. When you leave the familiar for the unfamiliar, there is vulnerability. And you have to have a certain humility to say, I don't know how to do this. I think one of the reasons that we gossip and fight so much among ourselves is because we're bored. You have nothing else to do but to get in my business. There's nothing going on in your house, so you're all up in my Kool-Aid. Get out of my Kool-Aid. I, I, might, I just might have to give you a big Hawaiian punch. Get out of my Kool-Aid. Now, some of you youngsters may not know what a Hawaiian punch is. Look it up on YouTube. You'll find out. You know how Elisha follows Elijah? And eventually gets a double portion of his mentor spirit. He now begins to understand something that was just recently revealed to me. And I just recently started to do. Because you see, most of my life I've been praying about situations. Some, somebody would call and have a situation. They would come to the altar and I'd pray for their situation and I'd pray to God. But we have to understand that God moves in generations. Uh, he, he, he works in our situations, but he moves in generations. And, and most of my life, I've been praying about situations to a God who moves in generations. You see, Israel understands this. The church doesn't understand this. Israel understands this because they know that he is a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul teaches that the same faith that was in your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice, I see, now see in you, Timothy. We spend too much time teaching generational curses when we should be teaching generational blessings. Because there's a glory on you that God wants to reproduce to the next generation. But it will never happen if you don't know as a father who you are. Because you will pervert your son rather than empower your son. Because you're scared of your own seed. And a man cannot re reproduce if he's scared of his own seed. Elisha was the recipient of Elijah's seed. 
his mantle, his glory, his vigor, his vim, his vitality, his tenacity, his auspicious grace, his wondrous anointing. It was so awe-spiring that Elisha walked away from the familiar just to have a taste of the unfamiliar. To walk out of nothing but a promise from God and say, Lord, I'd rather be in the wilderness with you than to be in the palace with them. I want something to happen. People don't make these kind of moves. We call them paradigm shifts. They, they don't make these kind of moves unless they're hungry for God. People don't step off the boat with the disciples and step onto the water unless there's something in front of them. There's more important... There's more important than what's behind them. Oh, it's easy to stay on the boat with people who play it safe. But every now and then, God will send one who will say, Hey, if it's for you, bid me to come and to step out of the familiar into the unfamiliar. And say like Job, though he slay me, yet I shall, shall I trust him. Oh, I trust you. When I, when I can't trace you, I trust you. When I don't understand you, I trust your wisdom. When I don't know what in the world is going on in my life, I don't know how this goes together with what, with that. But before it's all over, I do know that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, who are called according to his purpose. Some might say, what good can come out of this quarantine? What good can come out of COVID-19? What good can come out of this shutdown? What good can come out of the stock market losing ground? What good can come out of the church being closed to regular worship? What good can come out of people dying all over the world? What good can come out of this? I don't know what God has in mind, but I trust Him anyway. I trust him when I don't understand it. I don't understand this virus. I don't understand the shutdown. I don't understand the quarantine. I don't understand the whys. I don't understand all the things that are going on. But this I know. God is in control. God is still God. And all things work together for the good of, the, of them that love the Lord. Our called according to his purpose so the question comes to you are you called according to his purpose you are but do you love him today do you know him today if not today is your day receive him Receive his glory. He's waiting on you right now. Let's pray together. Father, we love you. And we thank you. And we praise you. And we give you glory and honor. We don't understand all that's going on around us. We don't understand why we have to stay inside. Oh, we hear what the, what the doctors say. We hear what the experts say. We hear what the government says. And we want to abide by those things so that we stay healthy, so that we keep from getting sick. But we don't understand it. But this we know. You're still in control. This we know, that when we discover what's inside of us, good will come out of it. We can be creative in spite of, that what we need is in our house, it's in us. Lord, if we don't have you in us, 
We, we struggle through this alone. We need your strength. We need your healing. We need your power. So Lord, right now we cry to you. We cry to you. Right where you are, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in. I invite you to open the door of your heart right where you are and accept Christ as your personal Savior. The Word says in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us of all unrighteousness. Those are promises. Those aren't just words on a, on a piece of paper. Those are promises from a God who's still in control. You may be sitting there thinking the government has taken all things away from us. No. No. God is ready to give life to you. You can take back the life that, that, that you think you've lost. Worry, depression, oppression, it can be gone right now. Anxiety, God is ready to heal you. Will you give it to Him? Right where you are. Lord, heal us in a mighty way. In Jesus' name.